Okay, got the PowerPoint for the recording, not for the crutch. Uh, okay. Okay, so where were we? Uh, we were on SCS page. Okay, so there's a couple things you need to do to make SDS page. One of those was add SDS. Okay, and to answer your question, I thought of a half of an answer to uh, uh, Wilson's question. I don't think it's gonna be binding the R groups because if it was binding the R groups, it would only interact with certain, certain amino acids because those R groups are what make the amino acids different. And the key to SDS is that it binds to all proteins uniformly um, at some rate per amino acids, I think. So it either binds every amino acid or it binds every three amino acids, but it, um, it coats the protein uniformly with a negative charge independent of the R groups. So I don't, so I don't think it would be interacting with the R groups. Uh, so that's half an answer to that question. What pHs uh, that usually, those two usually combine? What pH do you run an SDS page at? Or what pH, I'm not sure what. Yeah, specific. yeah, yeah, but. Um, the, it gets complicated. You're, gonna, you're getting into more complicated details. <laughs> uh, when you run into SDS page, um, you make two layers on the gel. And the top layer of the gel is, I think, 6.8. And I think the bottom layer is, I know it's different. I think it's 7 point something. But I'm not sure. Um, I'd have to look at my recipes because that's not something I have in the top of my head. I should though. Oh, I just haven't made a gel for so long because I've been out of the lab. Because I've been making these lectures. Uh, okay. Uh, that's a good question though. I should write these um, down. I should take a picture. So SDS clarification where it binds R groups question mark and then pH. Um, I know the top gel is 6.8, but I don't remember the bottom gel. But that is, you don't need to know it right now, but that is important if you're like in the lab doing the work, because when you actually construct the gels, like you make certain pH recipes, uh, and it does, it's important, it matters. Uh, okay. These are good questions. Very, very stimulating. Okay, uh, the other thing that you need to do is, so proteins, just like the quiz, proteins, the first layer of structure are the beads on a string, the amino acids, okay? Then these things fold and they form alpha helices or the beta sheets, right? Okay, and that is secondary structure, this is primary. Tertiary structure is, why is this thing? Tertiary structure is the global folding, and this is important for SDS page. And then a quaternary structure is important. Quaternary. So quaternary is going to be like cysteine disulfide bonds, um, and you need to break these apart. Okay. So to do that, to break these apart, you add what are called reducing agents. Okay. So when you add the reducing, the, excuse me, the reducing agents, it breaks the disulfide bonds. And what you're doing structurally are you are breaking apart quaternary structure. So if there are two subunits of a protein that are bound together with disulfide bonds, you have to break those apart. Because if you have two proteins that are bound to each other, that size is going to be reflective of the complex, not the individual protein, right? So you break those apart with reducing agents. The most common one is beta mercaptoethanol. If you see beta.me, that's beta mercaptoethanol. That is the stuff you smell in the skunk. It's a reducing agent. So that's commonly what we use. So you basically are breaking apart the proteins, breaking them down to their strings, and then coating them with negative charge. And then the folding is going to be broken apart by the detergent SDS detergent. Now there are some cases where you do not want to break apart the folding. Some cases you want to run the natural state of the protein. And in those cases you're going to be doing a different thing that's not STS page but similar. Okay, so that's STS page. Let's think about positive negative controls. Show example data. Let me pull up a figure that I did. Let's see, publication PDFs, PPP, where am I, pub hmm, I'll draw it out. Okay, 
And let's just do an example SDS page with a positive and a negative control. Okay, so one experiment that I did was we wanted to know, we were studying uh, mosquito sperm. Okay, because that's one thing I do in my lab is we study ways to make sperm of insects sterile. And there's a particular bacteria that you don't need to know these details, I'm just giving you the context. There's a big t particular bacteria that lives inside the testes and it modifies the sperm in one way. Okay, so we wanted, know, we wanted to know what protein is it using to modify the sperm. So what we did is we ran an SDS page gel. Lane one was a marker. Okay, the markers in this case, the same concept as the agarose gel, except in this case, you're looking at kilodaltons, which are the size of proteins. So you'll often do a marker from 200 to 10 kDa. Okay, so you want to know kDa, kilodaltons, it's measurement of size of a protein. And then in lane two, we put modified sperm, modified sperm, which was our test, test, and then in lane three was our negative control, which was unmodified sperm. And we wanted to know what's the protein that's modifying the sperm. So what we saw is we saw a bunch of bands of proteins of the whole cell, of the whole sperm cells. So all the proteins that are in the sperm cell, they came out in bands, but there was one protein that was unique in the modified lane. And we could tell it was unique because what we did is we looked for a difference. You look for something that's here, but absent there, okay? So SDS page is a very simple way to just visually compare presence or absence of particular proteins. And oftentimes where you guys will see this, very, very often, good, a good um, thing that you will see is biotechnology, a lot of times what you're doing is expressing proteins. So you want to know if you build a plasmid and you put gene X and you have a promoter that you're going to turn on to express your transcript, which will get translated into protein X. A lot of times in biotechnology, we want to purify protein X. And the first step in the process is to check whether or not your plasmid works when you turn the gene on, okay? So a positive control would be plus um, there's, different, there's different induction systems, which we're going to talk about, for, so I'm going beyond where I've taught you so far, but let's say IPTG, which is a sugar that turns on the LAC operon. So the LAC operon is run by a promoter, and if you add IPTG, it will turn on your gene X. Okay? So in one lane, you would run plus IPTG, and in the other lane, your minus control, you would have minus IPTG, no IPTG. And what are you gonna see? In hopes, let's say gene X is exactly 50 kilodaltons, what you're gonna see, hopefully, is you will see a big band here and nothing in the minus, okay? And then what you're showing is when I add IPTG, it turns my gene on, I can make the protein, and then from then on I can purify, but now you know that it's working because you can see it on the STS page. And yes, the stain, it's different stains, many different types of stains, um, but uh, Avery was correct when she said Kumasi. It's very, very, very common stain that you will see. It's blue and it binds to protein. So when you run this, you gels will all be blue bands because Kumasi binds protein. And if you spill it on your shirt, shirt is made of uh, proteins as well and it will stain your shirt. What? Is it? Like one that stains your hands too? Or? Yes, it will stain your hands. So you can wear gloves, but it's not, it's not toxic. It's not like ethidium bromide, which will go into your DNA. Um, so you don't want, you don't, well you wear gloves if you work with ethidium bromide. Okay, so now that you know SDS page, are we all kind of clear on that? Okay, now that you know SDS page, there's an elaboration of SDS page. What you'll see in molecular biology is there's a basic technique basic and then there's things to make it more specific okay so one of these is a western blot okay have you guys heard of that okay so western blot starts step one is an SDS page okay 
But a Western blot's job, an SCS page is looking at kind of like all the proteins that are in a sample, all of them. There's no specificity. If there's a protein there, it's gonna be a band. In Western blot, you are looking for a specific protein, protein X. And the caveat is you need to have an antibody. Okay, an antibody is a protein that looks like this, and its function is to use uh, its amino acids to bind specific proteins. So for every protein, in theory, you can make an antibody for it. You can make an antibody which recognizes the specific protein X. And you have to have an antibody to do a Western blot. Okay, so let's say, let's give you a scenario. So we run an SDS page shell, and we are checking if IPTG turns gene on. And we have plus IPTG, minus IPTG, here and here, okay? So this is what our sample looks like. Our sample this time looks exactly the same. And we should be able to see protein X right here, but we don't see anything. What do you conclude from that? There's nothing there. What's the conclusion? Maybe, but you've sequenced your plasmid and you know it's perfect. So logically, you didn't do anything wrong. Okay. It's, it's not, not affected by this operon. Well, it's not turned on. Maybe. Or, or, okay, so that, yeah, these are all good things. Maybe it's just literally not there. Maybe there's something that's, that's happening. Or maybe it's there, but it's hidden, or it's not concentrated enough, or it's very, very tiny amount, right? This is a very, very common problem. You want to look for a protein. When you run an SCS page, you're seeing probably the top 10% most abundant proteins in the cell. That's what form the bands. But there's all kinds of proteins that are very, very less abundant, not as expressed as high. Um, but they, in theory, they could still be there. You're just not seeing it, right? So a Western blot is what you would do, Western blot. And that's going to increase your sensitivity, sensitivity to your protein X, okay? So then the next step, so if step one of Western blot is SDS page, step two is you, I'm skipping some things, some details, but you just wanna get the basic concept. You add antibody for X, for protein X, and this is called your primary antibody. The definition of the primary antibody is it binds the thing you're looking for. Okay, so you add now antibody X. And if your protein is there, your antibodies will bind. And there's nothing in lane minus, so you're good at first. But you can't see these antibodies, okay? You can't see them yet. So then step three is add secondary antibody, okay? And the secondary antibody has bonds that recognize your first antibody. So you're layering antibodies, and the reason you layer is to amplify the signal, okay? So you add your secondary antibody. Your secondary antibody binds your primary antibody. And now you're starting to see patterns because in your secondary antibody, you put a probe that will shine Shine bright like a diamond. <laughs> so now what you see is in your western blot, western blot down here now, what you'll see is in your positive lane, you will literally just see your band for your protein and nothing in your minus. And the reason you don't see anything else, the reason you see nothing else, it's so clean, is because your primary antibody only recognizes your protein X. Does that make sense? Yes? Yeah. So do you have to make those antibodies? Yes. Uh, yes and no. There's tricks that uh, we might as well go into it because this is fun. Um, so you can do it two ways. That's a very good question. Let's talk about the hacks. So the first way is you can take protein X and you can inject an animal with protein X into its bloodstream. 
And you then you use that animal to produce its own antibodies. And then you can kill the animal, take all the blood, and purify antibodies that recognize protein X from the animal. Commonly, what you'll see is uh, rabbits. Rabbits are very good for making antibodies. You'll, you can do goats. Um, and there's all kinds of strategies for making antibodies. So that's one way to do it. Second way to do it is there are what are called epitope tags. So if you're really concerned that you might not be able to see protein X, one of the things that you might do is in your plasmid, plasmid A, gene X, you might insert a, what's called a tag. And a tag will encode amino acids that you can recognize by a known antibody that you can buy from a store. So oftentimes what I do, one is the harder route. It's a lot easier to add a tag. So oftentimes you'll see, for instance, flag tag. Flag tag, the amino acids are something like D, Y, K, 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 D, K, something like this. So you basically program that into your gene X so that your start codon starts here, ATG, and then you put in your flag tag, and then you have what's called a fusion to your X. Now every time that protein X gets made, X gets made, but it also gets made with a flag tag. And then you can use an antibody for flag, which recognizes that epitope in your Western blot to shine wherever that flag is. Does that make sense? So those are two common hacks um, of how you will do that. Um, this may be like more than you want to go into for no, let's hear it. I like it. Uh, monoclonal and that kind of designation, I have no idea what those mean. Okay, I'll explain them. Monoclonal, polyclonal. Okay. Um, I'm just thinking if there's anything else I want to talk about before that. Um, I just want to, quick to quickly, before I talk about that, define your primary is what you would make in an animal. And then your secondary, you'll see this in papers. So you have to be able to decode this, this information. So the primary would be, you'd see it nomen, you'd see the nomenclature as anti or anti X. So anti protein X, whatever the name of the protein was, X is a random variable. If it was GFP, you'd see anti GFP. That would be your primary antibody. Now, if your primary antibody was made in a rabbit, your secondary antibody is something you just straight up buy from the store and it's anti rabbit. And what it's recognizing is actually the IG, I think it's IgE, is the actual name of the antibody protein. It looks like a, it literally looks like a Y, okay? And it's, if it's from a rabbit, what you're, what you're buying in secondary antibodies is you're buying antibodies that recognize and bind rabbit IgE. Does that make sense? That's kind of complicated, so I just, that, that does make sense? Okay, monoclonal versus polyclonal. Good question. So monoclonal is gonna be very purified. So one of the things that, let's say you make antibody X by injecting rabbit with protein X. Protein X is this big globular thing. And rabbit, or whatever the organism is, but let's say rabbit, can make antibodies that recognize this region and they can make different antibodies that recognize this region, and they can make different antibodies that recognize this region. And if you just straight up pull serum, which is the blood of the rabbit, you're gonna get a mixture of antibodies that recognize your protein, right? So that would be polyclonal or monoclonal? Monoclonal. That would be poly. So that's a basically kind of like an unpurified sample. It's, not, it's multiple IgE antibodies that recognize your protein X. Now what's the problem with the polyclonal antibody? Problem with the polyclonal antibody is every single antibody has a region that recognizes X. And there's a chance that that region has nonspecific interactions with other stuff. So if you have a polyclonal antibody, it's usually less pure and your signal is usually less pure. 
because it can recognize different things. So you might run a gel, and instead of having one band, you light up a whole smear because it's rec you have a you have a unpurified sample that's recognizing many different things. Okay, sometimes it works well. Sometimes polyclonal antibodies work really well, and there's an advantage because polyclonal antibodies can be very very high highly concentrated. Okay. Um, but you can also make monoclonal antibodies. And in the monoclonal antibody, what you did is you took that serum and you purified out a very, very specific single antibody, IgE antibody. So that's monoclonal, very, very pure. Does that make sense? And all this is going to depend on the context of your experiment. Sometimes you don't need something. Sometimes quick and dirty is the best way to do it. Sometimes you need something extremely pure. All depending on the context. So that's antibody, primary, secondary. You got that. Show you the date. Let me show you data of a Western blot. Uh, here's one of my papers. Let's see. Got a bunch of Western blots in here. Okay. So here's a Western blot. This is anti ubiquitin. So what's your primary antibody? What's it recognize? It recognizes ubiquitin. So the primary is binding to ubiquitin. So what you're seeing here are, these are chains. You don't need to know this, I'm just this is an example. These are chains of, I told you that ubiquitin can form chains. It's a peptide that forms chains. And each of these is changed. So this is down here, mono ubiquitin, one ubiquitin molecule. This is, what do you think this is? Two, two dye. Di ubiquitin. This is tri. Quad, five, six, seven. Does that make sense? So you're actually seeing a laddering of these ubiquitin chains. Um, let's do this one. Anti flag. What are you seeing here? What's it recognizing? Flag. Flag tag. Flag tag. So here I made proteins. The protein X is actually called SID A, and I put a flag tag on it. So what you're seeing is the tag, which is a representative of the protein X because it's attached to protein X. So here you're seeing antibody that recognizes anti-flag. Anti-hiss. Remember what hiss is from the first? Histidine. Histidine. It's a hiss tag. So that's six histidines. So this antibody recognizes that tag, six histidines. Okay? So these are Western blots, and in each Western blot, you're going to have a primary antibody and a secondary antibody. And all these secondary antibodies are anti-mouse because the flag and the Hiss antibodies were made in a mouse. Does that make sense? If it doesn't make sense, I'm happy to slow down. That's just an example of Western blot data. So a Western blot is going to help you visualize a very specific target protein. SDS page is for, let's look at all the proteins that are in a sample. All right, almost done here. You'll see this patterns in molecular biology, okay? You have, again, I already said this, you have a basic experiment and there's ways to make it more sensitive or more specific. So let's say, let's say you do, um, you do SDS page on E. coli. Very, very easy, because we can just grow E. coli in soup. You literally just make soup and you grow E. coli. You can run those proteins. Okay, that's very, very easy. Imagine a scenario where you are doing SDS page on monkey sperm. It's gonna be a lot harder to get protein from monkey sperm, okay? so. The sample is going to be very, very rare and very, very precious. So you might just want to run just a tiny bit because you want to save all that sample, which is so precious to you. Okay, so you might want to just run a tiny, tiny amount, such a tiny amount that you can't see it with standard SES page. You wouldn't be able to see anything if you stained it with Kumasi. Okay, one way that you might hack this is you can radio label, radio label your proteins. And you can use radioactivity activity, to increase the sensitivity of your proteins. So one way you do this is methionine. Why is knowing your amino acids so important? Methionine 
Do you guys know what atom methionine has in it that in its R group? A sulfur. A sulfur. It's got a sulfur. And you can use radioactive sulfur, I think. I might be going out of my zone here, but I know you can make radioactive methionine. You make radioactive methionine. And guess what? Since all proteins have methionine at the start, as a start codon, all your proteins are going to light up with radioactivity. Okay? So it makes your SDS page much more sensitive. And the way that you develop this is you, instead of using like a fluorescent probe or like a stain that stains protein, you have a gel or you have a film that's sensitive to radiation. And then if it senses radiation, there's a chemical reaction that causes it to light up. So you can produce these bands, and this is called an auto radiograph. So you will see radiation in papers that you read. And the reason you see it is usually because it's a very, very sensitive sample that they need, they need very, very sensitive techniques to see what's going on. Okay? Um, immunofluorescence. Let's see. Immuno. Uh, there's always a U, I think. Fluorescence. Okay. So whenever you see immuno, what does that mean? Yes. What does the immune system make? Antibodies. Yes. Whenever you see immuno in molecular biology, that means antibodies. You're using antibodies. And you'd do yourself a favor if you just read a chapter on antibodies. I'm not going to assign it, but just for the rest of your life again, it's like you'll do yourself a huge favor. Because I never got that. Like, I never took, like, an immunology class. And it took me, like, 10 years to realize what IgE is, okay? So if you just, like, spend Wikipedia a day, not even a day, just spend five minutes when you're at home on your couch and read antibody on Wikipedia. Okay, antibodies. Um, so immunofluorescence is, is like Western blot, but in cells. So you have a cell, and you want to see where is X, where is protein X. You can make an antibody that recognizes protein X, and then your secondary antibody will have uh, something that shines. And then in your cell, in your plant cell, wherever your protein X is, you have your primary antibody binding, and then you have your secondary antibody binding and shining. So the data, let's just quick, let me show you what would this look like. Immuno, Im, immuno. I might have a picture of one. Maybe. Here we go. Whenever you see stuff like this, very, very fancy cell biology, this is immunofluorescence. So I could actually walk through this. So here what they have, they have something that's recognized in cytoskeleton, which is red, right? That's an, an antibody that's recognized in maybe tubulin or actin or something. Here they have DAPI. DAPI is not immunofluorescence. DAPI is a chemical that's binding to DNA. So their nucleus is blue. You'll see that a lot. Here they have something, who knows, maybe it's bacterial infection that's recognizing maybe an outer surface protein that's making it glow green, okay? So this is immunofluorescence. So you're recognizing proteins based on a specific antibody. And again, the key, whenever you see antibody, it means you're looking at something very, very specific. Almost done. Hang in there. Uh, okay. Problem with immunofluorescence. What's the problem? You have to kill the cells. There's also a way to look at where a protein is by looking at live cells, okay? The way to do that is there are fluorescent, fluorescent proteins. So you've heard of GFP. Have you all heard of that? Uh -huh. Okay, GFP is literally a sequence of amino acids that glows green, okay? And it's a tag. All you gotta do is attach GFP in front as a fusion to protein X. And now wherever you look in the cell, you can look at live cells, and wherever the GFP is shining, it's attached to your protein X. Make sense? Things get more complicated, you can have, it can, again, there's many, many elaborations on GFP. You can have YFP, yellow fluorescent protein, RFP, red fluorescent protein, CFP, cyan fluorescent protein, M cherry, which you'll see a lot, is red. This allows you to visualize where a specific protein is in a live cell. Okay, last thing that you should know. LC, MS, MS. This is called liquid chromatography. 
tandem mass spectrometry. Okay, and what you can answer with this is, let's say you have an SDS page gel, like we did. We had modified sperm, unmodified sperm, okay? And we had our bands, and there was one special band right there. We wanted to know, what is that? What protein is that? What is that protein? You can cut out that protein from that gel and you can do LC-MS-MS, which can give you the sequence of peptides in that band. And then that tells you what that protein is. So it's a way to go from a result on an SDS page to knowing what specifically that protein is. I won't go into the details of how you do it because I don't want to stretch your guys' um, attention too much, but uh, it's a way to tell what, it, what a band is. Okay, is that good? Okay, so let me close this recording.